Okay, so today we've got a double review of sorts for you. We're going to be reviewing the Infigo Audio Method 3 Mono Black Amplifiers, and we're going to review these beautiful titanium finished Hestia 2 loudspeakers from Alta Audio. First, let's set some context. I've known Mike Levy for, I don't know, eight or 10 years now, mostly through going to the Rocky Mountain Audio Fest, which for many years was held, um, I think it was 14 or 15 year run, they held it at the Denver Tech Center. And um, I wasn't familiar with Alta Audio speakers, but I've always wanted to review a pair because Mike got some really terrific sound, and I really love the sound that he had um, been getting at the trade shows. So to start off, Infigo um, has these ginormous, very heavy, I think it's approaching 100 pounds, certainly feels that way once you're in the uh, Nanook Pelican-like cases that they come in that are a beautiful bright orange. Um, they're sort of a CNC machined amplifier that puts out 250 watts of pure Class A power. They um, have an ultra wide bandwidth. They go from 10 hertz to 100 kilohertz. And they are, um, the build quality is a little hard to describe. They have a clear top on them. And as you, as you look into that clear top, you can see a lot of gold and silver plumbing, as Hans calls it. Hans Lumen is the designer. And that just adds to the overall feel of the amp. They've got beautiful copper. Uh, binding post for the speaker connections on the back and um, a very well done uh, XLR input as well. In terms of loudspeakers, we were working with the Hestia 2s, which is Alta Audio's flagship speaker. And this thing is really special. It has a 10 inch woofer, two 7 inch mid ranges, um, an amorphous ribbon uh, tweeter, and a 6 inch Hexel driver. So you've got basically a Dapolito um, configuration here, which Mike feels, that Mike Levy's the designer, he feels that's the best way to get a uniform sound field out to your ears. And then, it, but it's an open baffle design from about here to here. Then there's this big heavy box with his XTL bass transmission uh, on the bottom, and we'll talk a lot about bass uh, as the review uh, rolls on. These are a four ohm uh, lo load. Uh, they are 135 pounds a, a piece. They uh, offer some pretty high sensitivity. They're 90 dB uh, sensitivity. And their range is from 28 hertz to 47 kilohertz because of the ribbon tweeter. Um, I want to give some context about the setup because in order to basically make sure I was doing a good job on the review, um, I decided to set these up in the living room of my townhouse, which I am now sitting in. In fact, this is essentially the rug I'm sitting on where the system was set up. We have an unusual space because the, the reference room downstairs has very heavy uh, speakers in them and I didn't want to move them. And it's sort of tight to put in a whole new set of equipment. So what we decided to do is set it up in the living room. But over here around the corner is essentially a big base uh, escape path, I guess is the best way to call it, which is my downstairs, uh, the staircase that leads downstairs to both the garage and the reference uh, listening room. So in order to come that, I decided I'd go all out and uh, invite Jim Smith, who wrote the book Get Better Sound, to come over and help me do setup. Also before this, I like, as a <laughs> crazy audiophile, I like to have audiophile power outlets so my good friend Jim Patron came over. He's a retired electrician, and he installed the outlet to this uh, to to these wall to the wall behind me where we had plugged in the electronics. Uh, we'd actually we actually used a Shinyata Denali uh, limited edition power conditioner, which worked extremely well, and we plugged both of the mono block uh, Method Three Infigo amplifiers into it. Now we actually spent. Um, probably a, four weeks in total setting the system up. We wanted to overcome some of the acoustic issues with this room. This is a complex room in terms of a setup. And it also 
uh, required us to uh, manage some of the acoustical properties of the room using GIK panels, which we put at the first reflection point on both the right and the left uh, channel speaker. And these also wound up, I think maybe because they're more of a precision instrument, being a little bit more tricky setup than we're used to, possibly because of the open baffle design. But nonetheless, uh, Jim Smith came over. We spent almost two whole days setting this uh, system up, and we really wound up with a wonderful result. As I'm, <laughs> you know, know Jim Smith to do, usually he comes out the first day and the sound gets much better, but he's not quite happy. And in this case, I wasn't totally happy either, which is why he comes back a second time and sometimes a third and fourth time to really dial the system in using all the principles he's learned over 40 or 50 years. I think it's actually been 50 plus years of setting up systems. So it's sort of like taking golf lessons from Tiger Woods or Jack Nicklaus. He came over, we, we set this up, we got the laser measuring devices out, we got everything precisely set up in terms of speaker placement down to about two or three thirty seconds of an inch. So we were really precise about this and the imaging got much better, the sound stage locked in, but we also noticed that in order to change sort of the, the balance of this, the tonal balance of the speaker, Mike has built in a way to basically unscrew the spikes, which are like giant black tiptoes there in the back. And we added about a quarter of an inch or just under to sort of tilt the speaker forward enough to where we found the tonal balance to be dead on perfect. So the setup was quite an ordeal. We also played a lot with toe-in, and the toe-in varied uh, widely. And we played a lot with the listening chair. In, in, in Jim Smith's approach, the listening chair is often positioned using an RTA uh, device, measuring device, so we could find out where the most even spots of bass are. Now this is not as perfect a room as the reference room I have downstairs, but it's actually quite, you know, it actually worked out quite well. So once we had all that set up, I was free to hook up the electronics and begin the review. Um, we had two main sources. Jim brought over his Aqua La Scala DAC, which was a new device that I'd heard before and been impressed with, but I got to sit with it for uh, a couple weeks listening, which was really wonderful. It really is a tremendous piece. I think it sells for about $8,000. Uh, more around, I think, seventeen or 18000 was the Audio Research Ref6 uh, SE preamplifier, which I know to be a neutral piece because it's in my reference system. And then uh, we also had a Sony CD and SACD player, the SCD. 777ES, and we listened to disk on that, and we listened to computer files on, on Jim's system being fed by a MacBook Pro playing Aldervana. And he has about 75 test tracks that are specially curated to highlight different aspects of the system's performance, and a lot of the test tracks, uh, or the tracks and listening notes I have today to discuss, involve those test tracks. From, from those two components, they then went to feed a, a pair of 250-watt monoblock Method 3 amplifiers and those onto, using a single run of speaker wire, the Hestia 2s. Although you can buy wire uh, this, uh, for convenience we went with a, a single uh, run and used the jumpers uh, in the back. So um, without further ado, I think we'll go in and we'll talk a little bit about what I heard in terms of the, the tracks themselves. Just a brief interruption, esteemed viewers. As you may know, I'm Tom Martin, Chief Content Officer of The Absolute Sound. We have a new product. It's on the Substack platform, and we're going to do some interesting things with Substack, first of which is reader questions and answers each Monday. Readers will submit questions, we'll pick the most interesting ones, and we'll answer the questions on Friday. We'll also have early access to articles and special blogs that don't appear anywhere else. We hope you'll join us. It's only a cost of a cup of coffee per month. Just check on the screen or in the show notes below. Thanks, and now back to the show. This speaker was initially, for me, a little hard to get my, my arms around until I spent more time with it, and it sort of, as we got more and more precise with the setup, and we improved our, our sources in terms of how we were playing the computer files, and we actually even assembled a remote screen so we could sort of uh, go through the different tracks uh, at a far distance and play with the listening chair while we were listening to uh, some of the tracks, which helped us do an even more precise 
uh, set up. Starting off, let's, let's talk about what I heard listening because I want to flesh out some of the uh, main characteristics I found on this speaker and talk about what I think are the pluses of the speaker and the minuses of the speaker. Starting out, we, looked at, we listened to Lucinda Williams' um, Car Wheels on a Gravel Road track, which really sh highlighted, I think, both the mid-range and the tweeter in terms of the, cl the clarity of her voice was just spot on. It was really wonderful. Maybe it's the six inch Hexel driver, but it really had a lot of presence and that just thrilled me. I love this track. I, I think Lucinda is extremely talented and to hear that played back at a level that, that's close to my reference system was, was quite thrilling uh, for me. Um, so I started to become a little impressed once I heard that track. But then I moved on to a great bass track called Blue Bossa by Brian Bromberg, who uh, just makes wonderful recordings of his bass instrument. But if setup isn't really dialed in, you can't hear quite the fullness and the timbre of that instrument, I think, like Brian would want us to hear it. Fortunately, on these speakers, I discovered right away two tracks, and that is a forte of the Hestia 2s. The bass was quite simply spectacular. This 10-inch driver with Mike Levy's XTL transmission uh, led to a very natural, very full, but not overly boomy bass, uh, just a very taut bass. And there's a lot of percussive effects uh, on the stand-up bass that Brian is playing, and all those came through with a, quite a, a visceral impact. As time went on, I started hearing details in the background of recording that just sort of created more realism for me. Uh, an example of that is the Rimshot track, which is based on Miles Davis themes that Erica Badu performs. And you can really hear the backing vocals, the badu, badu. That sort of gets repeated as a theme in the background, and those vocalists are very present. And it's really a full soundstage where the vocals are being presented on the front wall behind me, because we were listening over there. And so that also added to my admiration uh, of the speaker. And I also kind of thought when Erica Badu's voice comes in a little bit later after the Badu Badu chorus, she comes in in a very present way, it's very clear sounding, and the speakers just completely and utterly disappear. They're just not in the room. You're hearing that live crowd, much like you do when uh, you listen to the audience on Keith Don't Go, or some of these other audiophile tracks um, that you'll hear at trade shows. It, it's sort of the difference between a smeared congeal of masses versus a collection of individual vocals and claps and hollers. And all that came through very clearly on the Rimshot track. So at this point, I'm rolling along and I'm listening and I'm thinking, okay, these are pretty good speakers. I like this. I like where things are going. Um, now, I'm sort of a Willie Nelson fan, and uh, one of Jim's test tracks is on the sunny side, and I really, I really like this song, I really like uh, Willie's voice, and you could really hear uh, the clarity, uh, particularly with the piano introduction on this track, and I think that the timbre of the piano, you know, much like other reference speakers that I've heard uh, uh, recently, including the ones I have downstairs, the, the timbre of that piano is dead spot on. So that, that really made an impression on me. Moving over to classical music, I queued up A.J. Oa's and the Minnesota Orchestra's version, or I should say performance, of Stravinsky's Firebird. Now this has a very soft intro. You have to turn the volume up because Keith Johnson, of course, makes this recording and includes all the dynamic range, which is exactly what we want to have happen. And it just sort of eventually gets rolling and it just takes over. There's gorgeous sound and, and, and gentility at the beginning, but it ultimately leads to the full orchestra sound with many, many layers and a wall-to-wall -wall soundstage. So this Stravinsky piece really convinced me that these were fantastic speakers. And I started to sort of move from being the audiophile critic and, and doing the review for the absolute sound to someone who's thinking also as much about the music as the gear and, and just getting involved in the music. And I think when you have speakers that do that, even someone like me who's taking listening notes and trying to be in 
hypercritical reviewer mode, um, that is an indication that these speakers are doing something special. And I think based on the smaller speakers that I fell in love with at the Rocky Mountain Show, they were also Mike Levy's design. This sort of answers the question, can Mike design a flagship speaker that's uh, significant or noteworthy? And, and the answer is uh, yes. Um, I started to think about, you know, I listen to a lot of jazz. I'm a collector of Blue Nut Records and all the uh, zillions of <laughs> issues that are going on now. We're sort of living in a golden age of jazz LPs. And I, but I started wanting to hear some other variety of music, so I actually queued up uh, Steve Terrell and Gene Monheit's version of Baby It's Cold Outside. And, and Steve does a wonderful job, but I have to say the star of this show is Jane Monheit. Her voice is just amazing. And the clarity of that voice and the soaring heights that it reaches were perfectly captured by the Hestia twos. So to me, that sort of erased any question on vocals. Moving on to a slightly different version of vocals, I played Jillian Welch's Tennessee song, which is a wonderful track, and her voice is just uh, uh, spectacular in the plucking of the strings on that on that track and this is sort of bluegrass bluegrass pop this this track is just uh, really well presented by this system I think the combination of the Infigo amps and the Hestias were doing something especially um, special on this track I think is what I would say um, I just felt like you know, this is a wonderful presentation. This sounds good. And by the way, all these tracks were at 1644. I did play DSD files, and I did play high-res PCM files, and it was even better. But I wanted to listen to these tracks because I have been doing a number of setups uh, with Jim's help coming over and setting up my systems and then going over to other people's homes. And these were tracks I was really familiar with, so I thought I could be more of a... I would gain more insights from the familiarity that I had uh, with these with these songs. Um, and then I think what I really look for personally, and I wanted to end on this because this is important to me and it's also a musician that I'm uh, quite fond of and have a, a pretty good swath of his catalog, and that is Ben Webster. There's something about the presence on his saxophone that a good audiophile system will capture especially well. And I don't care, these are solid state amps. I'm more of a tube guy, and look, I'm not going to say that these solid state amps were firing all my uh, buttons uh, uh, as a tube guy, but I would say the mid range was so good when Someone to Watch Over Me uh, by Ben Webster came on that I didn't really care. You don't really think about tube versus solid state. If the amplifiers are working, and I think maybe this is because they were Class A amps and we were listening to Class A feeding some great Alta audio speakers. I think everything there was working quite well, and I just didn't care that I was listening to solid state versus tube. Would have I preferred a tube amp? I don't know, maybe. But when the mid range is this good, who cares? I just sat back, I enjoyed it, I listened to the track, and I just sort of decided at that point that I was going to recommend these speakers. The combination of the Infigo mono block amplifiers and the Hestia two speakers sitting here over my uh, left shoulder. Uh, is a really good combination. And the good news here is after this review, and I've already packed up the electronics, I'll pack up this speaker, the other speaker's already packed up, and sitting on pallets in my garage. Tomorrow, a trucking company is going to pick these things up, and they're going to take them to a warehouse for the Expona show. And then Mike and Hans are going to show up a little later, set these up, and you're going to be able to hear this exact system at Expona. If you like the, I hope you like the system as much as I did, but if you want to have a second opinion, take your own ears over to Schaumburg, go see the Expona show, and hear this combination because that's where they are off to next. So let me talk about some broad takeaways I have of this system, and I hope this could be useful to you. If, whether you're interested in the Infigo amplifiers or electronics or the Alta Audio Hestia 2s or other Alta Audio speakers or the combination thereof, and that is that in general, I think uh, these speakers are doing a lot of things right. First of all, the speakers are disappearing with a proper setup. But do spend some time on setup if you do buy this combination. Second, there's a very wide, deep sound stage. Um, obviously, those go hand in hand. But obviously, that's exactly what you want when you've invested, you know, I think it's 40000 for these speakers or around that 
that range, and it's 50,000 for the two monoblock amplifiers. So this is fairly expensive stuff, but this is you want these characteristics uh, to inhabit your room, and they do. The other thing is uh, I'd point to very excellent dynamics. I think uh, on dynamic music, uh, the Hesias were capturing all of it. We talked about the Ben Webster track. It's got a glorious mid-range, airy highs. But I might suggest that perhaps the standout characteristic of this speaker is its ability to reproduce bass and reproduce it well with these Class A amplifiers, I might add. I always listen to the, that, that combination. So I think across the board, everything's working really well. If I was to come up with a criticism, I think the only minor criticism I would have would be that there's maybe a slight loss of clarity versus some of the other systems I've heard, but I don't really want to make a, play that up too much because this was a, uh, a difficult acoustic space, and I'm not sure if it's the combination of electronics or it's just the room that they've been placed in. But you might want to audition and see if, if that's a, a, an issue for you. And again, it's very slight. There was a lot of clarity we heard over these last two weeks. And once we got that set up going it, uh, uh, for the last week and a half, um, the, the amount of detail has been wonderful. I would say also that if you're more of a detail freak, maybe this combination isn't ideal for you. I think we're hearing a lot of resolution. But if you're the guy that wants to hear the proverbial fly farting on the back wall of the recording studio, this may not be exactly what you want. Uh, however, these have an, all the detail, but not too much, plus the musicality. This is a very musical, very smooth, in a good way sounding system, very warm. The timbres are right on the instruments. It's, a, it's, a, it's a, more of a sound I gravitate to. I think if there's a continuum from hyper analytical to syrupy warm and neutrals in the middle, I may be a little bit towards the warm side, just a smidge. If you're all the way over here to hyper-analytical, um, you might want to audition these first and see if you're hearing the resolution that you require. But again, that's a minor criticism, and it could have a lot to do with the room in which we did this review, which was a rectangular uh, living room in my uh, townhome. So I would say that um, I can completely recommend these speakers. I can recommend... Uh, and, and amp combination strongly. Um, and I think hopefully a lot of you will have the opportunity to hear them in Schaumburg at the Expona show. And I, I think that um, it's really been a wonderful four weeks as we've sort of set these things up, precisely you know, adjusted them. We did a lot of work in terms of the toe end of the speakers. And to get the tonal balance right, we actually tipped these forward. They have black tip toe spikes on all four corners, and we just tilted these forward just about, we, we unscrewed the spikes about a quarter inch in the back so we get the perfect tilt, and we actually went back and forth a couple of revolutions till that was dialed in, and that made a tremendous difference because that affects the tonal balance of the speaker. But overall, I'm impressed. I hope these insights have been valuable to you. Thank you for visiting our channel on YouTube. Thanks so much for your time.